This is Road to the Golden Door, where we unpack the proven success formula straight from the minds of Golden Door winners, uncovering the motivation, methods, and the mindset it takes to become an elite performer in door-to-door -door sales and in life. This is Road to the Golden Door. Now, here's your host, Mikey Lucas. Welcome back. Another episode, Road to the Golden Door. We've got Charlie Heaton here and an absolute stud and an OG in the industry. He's been doing solar and alarms. So anybody that's ever done watches this show um, knows that anybody that started in alarms uh, and made it out uh, and, and still has uh, something to show for it, um, they are somebody that's worth listening to. So I have, uh, I followed Charlie now for uh, a this last year and watched his uh, watched him grow in his his business, but then also his family. And I'm really excited to uh, to jam with you, Charlie. So, Charlie, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. It's good to have good to be here. And thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So uh, for everybody that doesn't know you, um, I know that you've uh, your, your story is, is one to to be definitely uh, put on a pedestal. I know that you might not think that, but I want to I want to show people like if if you can make it this long in door to door. Um, and be a Golden Door Award winner and have a outstanding company. You haven't you have moved once. You've been with the same company with the same leadership um, for I think going on twelve years now. Is that right? Yep, coming yeah, up. Yeah, that me. is yeah, twelve years. Yeah, uh, it should be hitting my eleventh year this year. Coming up on eleventh okay, year. Uh, going on yeah. going on eleven. Yeah. So that that is one that is just that is unheard of in the industry, right? A lot of guys jump around, whatever, whatever. And there's certain cases for that and whatnot I see. But in your case, I want to know really, you know, what, what is, who is Charlie Heaton? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, just a little bit about me. I was uh, born and raised in Utah and uh, joined the military right out of high school. So it was one of the, the products of uh, seeing 9-11 happen. And me and a buddy walked into the recruiter's office a week later and didn't really think about it more than once. Uh, surprised our parents came home, told my mom I was joining the Marines. <laughs> they, they started to cry and the rest was history. So uh, got out of high school, did, uh, did the military thing for about 10 years. And uh, my cousin, Mark Bench, who uh, a lot of people listening to this uh, podcast might uh, recognize from Vivint and uh, the Apex days, he had started an alarm company in Houston. And our original company name was TriGuard Protection. So I still have some old swag that says TriGuard Protection on it. And yeah, long story short, I had a really good friend from the military that uh, had gone out uh, for a summer with uh, one of the big companies and he'd done really well. And me being competitive, I said, man, I could do better than that guy. So I was getting out of the military, trying to find something to do with my life and to sign me up and go knock some doors and sell some alarms. So. Uh, I, I had reconnected with my cousin and figured out that he had started his own company in Houston and decided to go uh, join up with him. And that was the summer of 2012 and had a blast and haven't looked back. So it's been a great experience. Awesome. What was it like being in the military around that time frame? Um, man, it was, a uh, it was unnerving. There was a lot of uncertainty and, uh, when you join the military, uh, I joined in the reserves. So I was in the Marine Corps reserves. Um, I wanted to have an opportunity to still serve uh, an LDS mission and the reserves allowed me that opportunity. So um, I joined, went to boot camp, and you hear all the stories about, you know, the Iraq invasion, Afghanistan invasion, all that stuff. And you start to, to make friends and, and really, really, you know, make new, new family, new brothers. Um, got an opportunity to, to go on my mission and then came back and then found out we were getting deployed immediately to Iraq. So that was, you don't really know what to expect. So I was just an infantry guy in, in the Marines. Um, first deployment came and went, got back. Uh, being in the reserves, you don't necessarily think you're going to deploy too often. Uh, within a couple of months of being back, they told us we were leaving again uh, to Afghanistan. So um, I had met my wife in between deploying. In fact, uh, give her a little shout out. Uh, she was one of the first people I met when I got back from Iraq. She was the waitress at the restaurant we ate at. Um, if you're listening to this and you live in uh, Orem, Utah, 
uh, there's a Chuckarama, an all-you-can-eat buffet, and that's the first place we went. Uh, thought she was cute, and then decided to. We dated for about a year. Found out I was headed to Afghanistan, and she uh, decided to say, "Yep, let's get married." And so we did, and then I left. So my first year of marriage, uh, I was deployed. Got back. Uh, we uh, had a little girl a year later, and right then, about that time, I'd hit my tenth year in the military, and just decided that was it was time to get out. So. Um, I don't regret it. I loved every second I spent in the military. I made some absolute lifelong friendships, uh, impacted my life in ways I can't even understand or even put in words, but just hit that 10 year mark and decided it was time to move on and find something else. I love that. And how has, uh, how has, I guess the, 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 the best transition question there would be, how has the military affected your leadership within your family and within company that's a great question and uh and having now about 10 years having been out almost 10 years i've had a lot of chances to reflect on that um there, there's been some very good positive things i feel like the military uh instilled in me and then there's been some you know things i've had to kind of demilitar demilitarize myself from <laughs> um a couple of the positive things is just going through hard things and just knowing that i can do just some ridiculously difficult things and usually your body will try to give up uh uh, sorry, your brain will try to give up before your body will. And if you can push through that mental struggle and, and make it through mentally, your body can do some incredible things, some amazing things, um, especially when, when your mindset's right. So uh, just pushing through difficult things, st uh, staying mentally strong. Um, I'd say the military didn't really provide a lot of uh, interpersonal skills training. Uh, it was usually, especially the Marines, if you were uh, a higher rank than somebody, you could really just tell them what to do and they had to do it, whether they agreed with it or not. And then you get to the civilian world, especially in sales and you rub something the wrong way or, or you don't connect and they're out. They, uh, they say peace and they don't have to stick around, right? In the military, you have to stick around or you go to jail. So uh, there, there's been, and it's been a lifelong struggle for me is learning how to really connect wow. and, uh, you know, emotionally in a, in, a, in a more empathetic relationship with folks and um, be the kind of leader that people want to follow. And, and for me, that's then trying to lead from the front and, and being willing to do all the things that you tell people to do, not just saying that you'd be willing to do it, but, but very literally physically showing them that you'll go out and do everything that you, you've asked them to do. Um, I'd say those are some of the main main things about the military that's helped me. I would love to dive into that a little bit deeper if you can. Um, I, I noticed what you said there is the like the mental resiliency and being able to, you know, being able to take that, uh, you know, that brother the brotherhood that you have, and I know how important that is within a culture within your guys's company, and I know how important that is with you within your family. Um, just, just by, you know, getting to know you through the internet. And I know it's funny how, like, you know, we, we kind of put all the good stuff on the internet, but you know, I, I, I tend to say that I can see through a lot of, you know, what's going on with, you know, being able to, I guess, being in door to door sales for 10 years, like being able to read people, even on the internet, like I can kind of see what's going on, even if you're smiling, uh, on the internet. Um, but I, I, I'd really want to know the difference and, and if you can, if you can help dive into that a little bit more. Um, a lot of the guys that I've interviewed and girls that I've interviewed were military and ended up hitting golden door award. Um, for the ones that are not military or their parents were, you know, not in the military, didn't, you know, my parents, for instance, my dad, just to give you an example here. My dad ran, you know, ran, a, uh, was on, lived on, a, was raised and worked on tuna boats. My whole family ran and owned two big tuna boats out of San Diego. And so we, you know, very much so ran a very, organized military style home. Uh, mm. I think boat life was very boat life at home um, was very much similar to military. Um, we didn't, it wasn't, we didn't have a choice. Like we didn't ask my dad, you know, to do the chores. It wasn't, you know, I didn't get to ask, I didn't get to ask if I could clean my room. It was clean your room. And yep. that was it. so, um, yeah, I, let's talk about the mental side first. Um, you said like mind over body there, like your brain gives up before, I mean, your, your brain gives up before your body will. Um, how, how's that affect, how's that affected you today? And like, t just give me some examples of that within, within, if you were to go back to, so if you were to go back to 
what year did you, what year or years did you hit golden door? Uh, 2020 was the okay. year. So let me, let me walk you back to that year right there. Tell, walk me through how many times your body, your mind rather wanted to give up when you knew your body could keep going forward. So let's go back to 2020. Walk me through that year. Tell me, tell me how your, your mental resilience has grown and, and how the military um, helped you through that year. Uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, so if you remember 2020, uh, the beginning of 2020, everything was normal, right? Uh, I, yeah. I was in, I was in well, Disneyland. I, I was, golden door, bro. Yeah, I was in Disneyland with my family when uh, a couple of weeks later, Disneyland shut down. At the beginning of the year, uh, I had hit, you know, 70, 80 installs uh, previous years. And I really had a goal just to hit, uh, to break 100, uh, hit 100 installs. Um, I told my wife, I said, hey, I've got a goal this year to hit 100 installs. This is what it's going to need. I'm going to need uh, this kind of support. I'm going to need to work this much. I know my numbers. I know my metrics. So I know how much time I need to spend on the doors. I know how many people I need to talk to, how many credits I need to run, uh, how many of those are going to pass and how many of those are going to close and how many of those are going to go to install. So I, uh, over the years, I've, I've, I'd become very intentional about my numbers and my metrics. And I knew how long I had to work uh, and how much effort I had to put in to be able to hit 100. And I had it in my mind. I was going to hit 100, 100 installs. And that was my goal at the beginning of the year. Um, and then I actually had a really slow first quarter. <laughs> I had a, had a terrible first quarter. Uh, we went to Disneyland, spent a week and a half there. I think Q1, I only installed like eight, maybe nine accounts. So I was already starting behind. And then COVID hit. Um, and I remember when everything was shutting down and there were conversations about, hey, can we even knock doors? The entire state of Texas shut down. Um, in my, in my mind, I said, I made a goal. I had a target and a promise to myself that I was going to hit. And I didn't qualify that. I didn't say, well, if this stuff happens, then I'm going to let myself off the hook for my goal. Or, or at least, you know, I'm not going to put as much effort into hitting it. And so uh, when everything started to shut down, I talked to my wife and said, I still want to hit my goal. People are going to be home more often. When, when everything shut down, the positives were people are going to be home. They're going to be using a lot more electricity because they are home. And so these circumstances are perfect <laughs> for door knocking. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to, I want to throw it out there. Like I, I wasn't trying to be insensitive to uh, the magnitude of COVID and, and how it impacted people, but I reflected and, and said, uh, mentally, I had a goal. I had a target I was going to hit and I didn't qualify that. I didn't say, Hey, if, if some pandemic rolls through, then I'm going to give my, let myself off the hook and not hit my goal. So, one of the things we did as a company, you know, we had 30, 40 sales reps uh, in the state of Texas. One of the things we did as a company is there was one city in the state of Texas, uh, Midland, Texas, of all places, oil country, oil uh, country. That, that didn't shut down. They, they didn't shut down to the extent that every other city did. And so we said to anyone that felt comfortable and was interested, we, we paid for a bunch of Airbnbs, paid for gas, paid for food. And we, we converged on this little city of like 300,000 people with 20, 30 sales reps. Uh, we put several hundred accounts in, in that city over a couple months time span. Um, and that for me helped really spark uh, this idea that I, I can hit a hundred accounts this year. Um, cause we, we did a lot of volume there, had a lot of people that were also interested in continue to provide, provide for their families, help the company continue to stay profitable. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say through that entire year, we didn't let any crews go. We didn't let any employees go due to not having work or due to not having, you know, being able to pay them. Um, and it was in large part due to the resiliency of our sales reps, uh, that were willing to go out there. You know, we wore masks, we stayed ten, uh, you know, six feet away. We didn't go out if we weren't feeling sick and all that. We, we didn't go in a lot of houses. A lot of the appointments were on the doorsteps or, you know, on the patios and back, but we found a way to still win, uh, despite having these challenges pop up. And then over the next several months, things started to open back up slowly. Uh, we were fortunate enough to recruit a couple of pest control company, uh, teams that decided to knock doors in the off season. And so we had them come out and helped, uh, have, have a lot of set appointments and that really sparked a lot of it. Um, a lot of it was self-generating, just going out and knocking doors because I absolutely love knocking doors. It's one of my favorite things to do. A lot of referrals during that time period. And yeah, really just looking at the circumstances and coming up with reasons to go and win and, and ways to use those circumstances to your advantage rather than 
uh, reasons why maybe someone else would justify you quitting. Anyone could have said, hey, COVID hit, don't worry about your goals, man. It's all right, no big deal. Every, you know, people would understand. But that year I was, I was just determined to hit that number because I'd never hit it. And it started to become more and more possible as the year progressed. And by the end of the year, I, I actually hit 100 on the, on the nose. <laughs> I hit 100 installs. I had sold 101 accounts, 100 of those went to install. So I'm pretty, pretty proud of that install to, to sale ratio. Uh, that's, yeah, let's go, that's pretty bro. high, right? Uh, I had to sit I mean, in 200. That's a high success rate. Uh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Uh, I had to sit in a little over 200 houses, uh, 230 to be exact. Uh, and it was a heck of a year. It was a lot of fun. And um, yeah. Awesome, dude. So a couple of things I caught there that I want to point out that I want our listeners to understand this. Um, again, if you're listening to this, I hope that you're taking notes. This is, I mean, Charlie just went through some of the most crucial attributes of a golden door award winner. I mean, this is so consistent in golden door award winners that I've interviewed um, and top performers. I, I, I just, I'm going to start at the top. Um, let's talk about the, 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 the gooey gory stuff first. So my guys and girls that are married have a significant other. You, you, you expressed to your wife that you needed your wife's support and your family support first. Let's go through that first. Tell me, cause this is what, again, this is why I told you before the show, I was like, Hey, like this isn't a sales podcast. Like I want to, I want to get to the, the details of what people are not talking about. And one of those is talking about how to have a how do, I don't care how much money you have if you're an absolute horrible person to your family and your kids, right? You know, you're, you're a horrible person, you know, to, to your wife. I, I don't, I don't, that you're not my friend, right? Like, I, like, I don't even want to interview that kind of type of a person. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I do a lot of this vetting. Like, just because the standard is golden door to, a golden door award winner to get on this podcast doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to interview you if you, if you're a terrible person that, you know, you're, you're all about you, but I, I, I love that, you know, you said that first, that that was the first thing you did. I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but, you know, you started with your family. I can tell that your family is very, very important to you, Charlie. Um, bro, tell me, tell me about how do you get, I just got married, by the way. So congratulations. For, yeah, we've been, thank you, bro. We've been married for I think like six or seven months now. Um, dated for two years, dated during COVID. Um, but how did you get your, like, again, this is, this is built for other Golden Door Award winners. They have, they ask me these questions. The guys that I consult and coach right now and mentor, we go through this a lot more than I actually expected, but it's one of my favorite topics to talk about is how do we have whole life success? Not, I, dude, the easy, Charlie, you know this. The easy part is to tell you how to sh show you how to knock on doors and, and make money. That's the easy part. If you just showed up to work every single day, like literally, and you just did what I told you to do and, and, and found out why I'm telling you to do what I'm telling you to do, you're, you're going you're gonna to make money because people are already buying our product. We're not selling timeshares, insurance, this, that, the other thing. Like they're buying, they're already buying our product. We're helping them, whether they're Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, for the environment, against the environment, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. They're buying our product. And anybody at the end of the day, you know, as you know, being in Texas and I've, I've, I've done my served my time in Texas as well, selling solar panels and, and doing solar door door here. Like this is an oil country. So th the good part is that, you know, again, they're already buying our product back to your family. You wanted to get your family on board. One you decided, which I thought was really cool. Um, a lot of guys. Yeah. We'll get back into that later, but w w how did you get your wife on board? How did you get your family on board at that point? Your, 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 your daughter would have been, you know, in the single digits at that time, eight or nine years old, your, your son was five years old, six years old at that time. And you, you had a newborn six months so old. How yeah. You, yeah. How did you do that? Man, I, uh, I, I, I can't express enough, uh, my gratitude for my spouse. She, uh, has, has been extremely patient with me through the years. I'm not an easy person to get along with. And, um, you know, we've had our ups and downs as well. Um, but, uh, she knows generally when I say, hey, I've got a goal I'd love to hit. Um, she knows that often means sacrifice and 
you know, long nights putting kids to bed. And, um, and we had a conversation. It wasn't like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Deal with it. You know, this is what I'd love to do. This is the income that would come from it. This is what we can do with, with that income. And, and personally, it'd be extremely fulfilling for me to be able to hit that as, as a milestone in my career. And she was all for it. Um, so, yeah, I can't express enough gratitude to her for that. Um, and, my, and my kids knew it, too. So I shared my goal with my kids. And every time, you know, like they'd come home, uh, if, I, if I happened to get home early on an evening and help, you know, be able to put them to bed, you know, they say, Daddy, did you get a sale? And, I, I, and I'd have to answer to my kids, right? Because they were keeping me, keeping me honest. And, and I was like, no, I didn't get one today. Or, yeah, I got one today. And they were super proud of me. So I, I really felt a lot of support from my family. Um, you know, in their, in their, in their prayers, they say, help, help daddy get a sale and all that stuff. And it was, it, it was a, a fun experience, a fun way to connect with my kids. Um, and, and hopefully they'll remember, you know, the, the, the value and the importance of having goals and having, uh, setting goals and, and being goal oriented. But, um, yeah, number one, first and foremost, if you have anyone in your life that, uh, plans on you being a certain place at certain times or relies on you for, for, you know, emotional or, uh, physical support and you have goals and dreams and targets and, and things you want to accomplish. Uh, if you want that relationship to still thrive, uh, they, th that needs to be a, an enrollment conversation. Um, and if not, it's, it's going to add, you know, exponentially to, to that degree of magnitude difficulty in you maintaining that part of your life and, you know, earning, earning the money and uh, hitting your goals. Cause you know, so, some people would say, Hey, uh, maybe that just person won't, that, that person just wasn't for you. Like they're not, they don't see the vision. They're not in on what you want to accomplish. Uh, but for me, I see it the other way around. Like th there's not an amount of money or success that's worth losing that kind of relationship, at least for me. And so if she was, if she was, uh, you know, the opinion of, Hey, that's going to take too much time. That's not worth it. Let's not do it. Then th there would have, I would have made an, an adjustment to what I was putting out there because I, I, she comes first and my family comes first. So, um, and I will say a little bit about this. Like there was a, a massive amount of sacrifice. The idea of work-life balance didn't exist in 2020 for me. It was work, work, work with a little bit of life. Um, my kids weren't super old yet. They weren't into a lot of sports. And, and so I wasn't having to sacrifice missing any of my kids' soccer games, which my daughter does a lot of that now. And I get a chance to to be a part of that and not miss any of those. But there was uh, this, this work-life balance that for the year, it was extremely unbalanced. And we were prepared for that. We had that conversation as when, when, when I have an opportunity to be with the family, I'm going to do my absolute best to be as present and focused and dedicated on my family time as possible to make it quality, even though we're not going to get the quantity. And you know, I wasn't perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm glued to this dang cell phone. And, you know, I take customers calls. That's just the, the, the text messages at 11 o'clock at night and, and you know, the life of the salesperson. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't have done it without the support of my spouse and my family and them cheering me on uh, that, that, that meant the absolute most to me. Thank you for sharing that, Charlie. I really appreciate that. Um, a lot of the guys that are on listening to this podcast and girls that listen to this podcast need to hear that. Um, you know, the, the, um, the level of sacrifice needed to be a top performer year after year, and then go in like you're doing now and creating other top performers, um, that, that level of sacrifice and commitment, um, you know, win at all cost mentality, uh, I would say is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a cost that most people, uh, they just, they bow out, they bow out They're They don't, they're not. It's not, it's not worth it to them. And uh, my hat's off to you that you've been able to do that year after year and now going on 11 years, um, having three beautiful children, having an outstanding spouse and, and partner as well, and your wife. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, it's an honorable thing, man. So really definitely good. not, definitely not without its challenges. You know, we learned a lot about each other over that year and continue to, we've been married almost 13, almost 14 years now. And, it's a uh, never dull moment being married to a sales guy. And uh, huh. if she didn't know what she was getting into, she, she might not have signed that paper, but uh, she's, uh, she, she's incredible. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
2020 is when my wife came in the picture. My girlfriend at that time came in the picture. And uh, yeah, it was it was definitely interesting when the whole world was shutting down or shut down. And we were like, go, 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 go. I think we were up 36% that year. Not I think I know we were up 36% that year. Um, and it was, uh, it was a very interesting time. Very interesting time. Uh, she got to see, and I, I think I told her multiple times. I don't think I know. I told her multiple times, like, Hey, like, you know, if this isn't for you, like, it's not a big deal. Like, no worries. Like, this is how it's going to be forever. Like I am not stopping and it is going to be go, go, go. And that means, you know, whether I'm traveling to one of the offices or whatever. Um, so I, I just, I know, uh, I know that our, our, uh, our listeners needed to hear how to get, you know, the support on there. How do you, you know, cause again, not only that, then it's like, Hey, we've got the other, we've got other listeners that listen to the show and they're they're you know, they don't have kids, you know, they don't even have a wife or a significant other or spouse or whatever, you know, and let alone that they, they can't, they have a hard time managing the 168 hours they have in every single, in every single week, you know, 24 hours in a day, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're doing that by while running offices, while running a, you know, a company, having three children and a wife. Uh, and, and I'm over here uh, a little shameless plug. I don't know how I'm going to have children and run the companies that I'm doing right now. I don't know how it's possible. Like I really, I swear I'm on my, I don't know. I'm, I'm literally, actively afraid like how is this going to make sense i hear you yeah no i hear you <laughs> uh so thank you so thank you because your guys like you charlie are ones that i can say if charlie can do it i can do it yeah so just like anything else you know uh if charlie can do it i can do it and if mike can, can do it you listening to this show can do it as well yeah i love Thanks. it appreciate it yeah, you bet. Um, first of all, don't let's not just skip over the fact that you had a hundred percent install rate. That's not a ninety nine point nine 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 percent, a hundred percent success rate. Okay, in installs, that is not easy to do. Um, I want to go back to that. I'm just I'm gonna just put a note here to go back to that. Okay, uh, dude, that is wild. I love that. Um, it's not unheard of. Obviously, you've done it, um, and you're probably still doing that. You're probably still in the high 90%. And I think it's crazy. I was just on a call with uh, a team and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm at like a 48, 55%. And I'm like, you're lying. You don't even know your numbers. You're probably in the thirties. I had a, in my first three years, I think I was at a, not in my first three years on my third year, I had 36% pull through rate. And it was like, my manager was like, Adam was like, bro, what's up? I'm like, I, what, what's up, dude? But I'm averaging 12 deals a month. What, what's up? You know? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to that year. Um, I want to talk about your numbers. You you knew your numbers. I think that's so consistent. Anybody that's listening, take this note. Um, a golden door, an attribute of a golden door award winner, which I have like a little note here of attributes because I'm taking notes on, on uh, and I don't know if I'll write a, a book or memoir or something on this, but I'm taking, cause I want to understand this too. Cause not just for myself, but you know, what are the attributes of a golden door award winner every single time I haven't like missed one that they knew their numbers and you were like, yo, I know how many credits and I sit down. I mean, how many credit checks I need to do, how many people I sit down with all, like all this stuff, you knew your numbers. I am an obsessive person when it comes to knowing my numbers. Um, I absolutely, I mean, the last few years I've tracked between 65 and 75% of my waking hours to a micro action to a micro action. Right now I am, I am tracking on the app, a tracker, which is just not like a sponsor of the show or whatever, but like, I just use them a lot. Cause that's, I've, I've talked about them a lot. Um, they should give me a sponsor. There you um, go. it's a free app by the way, but anyways, um, I track podcast, you know, recording podcasts right now. Um, I track, you know, quality time with my wife, um, you know, spiritual time with my wife, wife with family and friends, wife spending time with wife and the dogs. Like I track those things to a micro action because it's important to me, you know, tracking time with my top 20%. If you listen to John C. Maxwell, which I'm going to get into leadership stuff with you later on. But um, if you, if you, if, if, if you, you can't, tra you can't change things you're not tracking, right? You can't manage things or multiply things you're not tracking. So yeah. tell me about why numbers were important to you. And I just, just give me a brief explanation of that. Like, why are these, why are these numbers important to you? 
knowing yeah. the numbers. That uh, what, what you said is like is next level. That's impressive stuff. That's you know, there's another level I can take that to. Um, for me, I mostly just track the work side of that because um, one of the biggest fears I think of salespeople is that sales isn't always predictable. And and predictability uh, in quotes, it's sure. it comes down to your your perspective and knowing your numbers. Um, at, at, at a certain point in my career, I was able to. It's extremely predictable. I knew if I put up a certain amount of, of work hours, something controllable that I can control put in a certain amount of hours, I'm going to get one set appointment. So for me, it's every 45 minutes, I'd set one appointment. I'd have to set at least like two and a half to get one to sit with me. I'd have to sit with at least three to get one to pass credit. Sorry, at least four to get one to pass credit uh, and get at least two and a half credit passes to actually sign. And then my sign to pull through rate was pretty high. So I knew that if I were reverse engineer that, it gave me the amount of hours I had to spend on the doors. Uh, the amount of our, uh, people I needed to talk to, the amount of appointments I needed to set, people to sit with, credit passes I would get, people I'd get to sell, and then sell to install. So it became extremely predictable. Maybe one day I'd have a really crappy day. I'd go you know, knock for four or five hours and not set a single appointment. The next day I knock for five hours and I set 10 appointments. It's, it, the law of averages at some point, if you put in enough time uh, over a large enough sample size, uh, which for me, was years of data that I'd been, been working through and tracking and setting up systems to be able to even track it. Um, then being able to say, hey, I want to hit 100 installs, so let's reverse engineer what that's going to look like this year. Um, part of that was, was uh, how do I multiply my efforts by helping find some potential appointment setters that are going to, that I'll help go train and that are going to go set appointments. And then I know I just need to sit in this many houses and get this many credit passes that'll go to sale. So uh, understanding and working that angle as well was extremely helpful. But that, that for me men mentally, um, one of the things I've really focused on is trying to turn the little emotion switch off and, and not uh, approach sales emotionally and approach it very uh, mechanically and, and machine-like, you know, input in, input out, what you put in, if you have the right formula in the process, you're going to get an output. Um, and the more I've focused on my processes, the more it's become very predictable. And, and, and frankly, that's, that's a lot of fun, a lot of fun knowing that over a certain period of time, I'm going to yield a certain amount of results. Um, and, it, and, and I don't have to have that part of me that's concerned, where's the money going to come from? Uh, because I've reverse engineered exactly how it's going to work. Yeah. Easier said than done is what I hear a lot when people say that. Um, break that down even further for the the, the person that's, that's, that's installing 60 to 80 deals a year, break that down a little bit further, because as you and I both know, and you, you obviously do mentoring and coaching within your company and leader, leader as a leader in your company, um, break that down a little bit further for the ones that are installing 50 to 80 deals a year. Like, like, cause you, you know, like literally if they just track their numbers and they're at 50 deals, they will literally be at a hundred and a hundred deals a year, hundred, if not 150 deals a year with the same exact effort. So explain what that, explain the mental side of that, of why tracking your numbers is so important. Yeah, the, the, the difference between that 50 to 80 account rep and that, that 100 plus is what I call using the seconds, not the hours. Um, if you know uh, over a certain period of time, you need to knock so many doors and talk to so many people. Um, for example, uh, we have a sales rep at the company. Uh, I'll give him a shout out, his name's Aaron Quesada. I went and shadowed him. He's out in El Paso. Uh, I went and shadowed him one day and uh, we were going to go out to an appointment. We we're going to be about 15 minutes early. And I showed up and I'm looking around and he's not in his car and he's not on the doorstep of the appointment. Like that kid's out knocking doors. He's not, he's not creating the proposal. No, right. No, no, no. Right. Exactly. He's, you know, scrolling Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, TikTok, whatever the kids do these days. Uh, that kid was out knocking doors and I don't, I don't think it was just because I was out there because he's a high performer. It wasn't just because, oh, Charlie's going to be out here. He, you know, he's, I got to look good for him. That kid was already hitting some doors. And guess what? He didn't set an appointment in that 15 minutes. But that idea that I'm going to use every single second uh, as, as wisely as I possibly can and do something that's always prospecting, always revenue generating rather than finding an excuse to be fake busy, um, that kind of thing for me uh, became extremely important, especially because there were times I'd have four, five, six appointments in a day. And if I had one cancel or no show, which always happens, I had two choices. I either go sit on my thumbs and do something unproductive or be fake busy, 
or I could go knock some doors. If I had 10 minutes, if I had 30 minutes, if I had 90 minutes, um, using that time to go and do the most effective thing that could be done during that time made all the difference. So if I knew how many doors I needed to knock and I knew how many people I needed to talk to, then if I knew I was already, you know, at four or five people I've talked to and I didn't set an appointment yet, I knew all I needed to do was go talk to one or two more people and I was going to get a set appointment. It's just, that's just the way it is. And if I didn't, that's fine because the next day or the next week, if I always had that mentality that I was always hitting the numbers that I knew I needed to hit. Um, and so for the people that are between that 50 to 80 mark, it, it's really time management at that point. It's understanding your numbers, how many people you need to talk to, and then managing your blocks of time effectively in a way that's going to cause you to do the actions that would have the results based on your numbers and your metrics. And one, one other exercise I like to do is I like to look at the day back in my calendar. If I couldn't go backwards in my calendar and tell you exactly what I was doing at exactly that particular time of day, I didn't manage my time effectively. If there were gaps of my time where I had to, oh, shoot, I don't know what I was doing. I think uh, this appointment canceled. And I think I went to a gas station. You know, if, I, if I didn't have specific things lined out, then I didn't use my time wisely. And so daily you, you would see exact you know, down to the 15 minute inter intervals, increments, drive to this place. If they don't show, knock these doors, go to this appointment. If it doesn't show, knock these doors, knock this neighborhood for this time. There was not a single second. I didn't even have a plan you know, between 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. that I, I never went into a day blind. I knew what I was going to do. And if people didn't show, I knew what my backup plan was. And then it wasn't, it wasn't an unknown. I, I knew that I just put that amount of time in. I'm going to get the results. Whether people show up for their appointments or not, I didn't have to get emotionally attached to the actions of somebody else. I knew I just put in the work and, and the results would, would follow. I know if I put in the work, the results would follow. If only, if only, if only people would actually believe that. Why do you think mentally people don't believe that, Charlie? <sighs> That's a great question. Um... Hard, huh? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they got to get a taste of it. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you have a new rep come on board, uh, they've never knocked doors before, or maybe they have, but they haven't knocked solar. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty, lack of self-confidence. And one of the things I love the most, if I go out and, and shadow somebody for their first day, I love them to see me get my butt kicked. I love to, ha I would rather them see me go two hours and then set, a, set an appointment at the end of two hours rather than we go knock an hour and I set four appointments because I would rather them see what the grind looks like, but then allow them to get a taste of the success after you've paid the price rather than, oh man, this guy set four appointments in an hour. I should be able to go set four appointments every hour. Um, so helping people see and really experience what kind of price you have to pay to get the experience and the training, but then also get a taste of that success and then build on that. Uh, help people remember uh, and build their self-confidence that they can do it. And yeah, some, sometimes, you know, you can lead a horse to water. You can't necessarily force them to drink. You're, you're also going to have those people that uh, are, are going to be emotionally and mentally resilient and, and those that haven't quite picked that up yet. I love that. Thank you for chatting about that. I think yeah. knowing your numbers is, is, is very, very important. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's literally the, the differentiator. Like if you're, if you're listening to this and you're already a golden door award winner, imagine get, becoming a double golden door award winner. Now it is hitting 260 installs. Um, if you knew your numbers even better, if you knew where each of the 168 hours of your week went, I mean, imagine how much more efficient, effective, and productive you would be. Like, imagine, imagine where you'd be at if you knew where every second went. You said a quote there. Um, can you remind me of that? Um, you don't go to the hours, you go to the minutes. What, what was that? Yeah, I don't necessarily focus on, on the hours. I focus on the seconds. Um, if I have time in between appointments or if I have uh, a, a Space that's available. I look at what's one of the most effective things I could possibly doing during, possibly be doing during this time. If it's between three thirty and eight thirty, 
usually that answer is prospecting, going and knocking new doors, finding people that are home. You know, maybe after 8.30 or before 3.30, I'm doing texts and sending follow-ups and doing, doing some of the busy work during that period of time. Um, and, and at the same time, if I don't have busy work to do, a lot of people whose pipelines are pretty, pretty empty and they don't really have people to follow up with, then the best thing to do is go out and prospect and set, set new appointments, find new contacts, uh, get n- new leads. And so that means you're prospecting at 11 o'clock, you're prospecting at 9 a.m. If, if you don't have the people to follow up with, you don't really have a, a process in place to do that. Your most effective thing to do during that time of day is go find people to talk to. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of knocking at nine, between nine and 12, uh, big proponent. So a lot of guys have created multiple golden door road winners and the guys that would listen to the starting early on doors, mm-hmm. doing your busy work during the not most non-productive hours of the day between 12 and 2, 12 and 3, and then hitting your numbers uh, and getting referrals is, is uh, the guys that, again, that just keep, continue to hit it. So know your numbers. You, you then talked about how you didn't give yourself excuses. So, I mean, for the most part, you had like 10 months to hit this golden door. Um, and you, you said you didn't give yourself excuses and you had your, your mindset sounds like you had a can do attitude and a, whatever it takes mindset, you know, a win at all costs, no excuses. Uh, it sounds like that came potentially from the military for 10 years. Explain to me a little bit more about like in, in that year, in the golden door year, where your mindset was at, you said, I'm not going to give myself excuses again, back to the, 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 the guy or the girl that's, that's about to hit golden door this year, or that's going to hit golden door next year. How do, how do you explain to them? Like, Hey, no matter what, we're all going through it. You know, you got to give yourself notes. You can't give yourself the ability to have excuses and a win at all costs, you know, mindset. Can you explain a little bit of that? Uh, yeah. Um, p- part of the no excuses kind of mental, you know, internal conversation I try to have with myself, and I'm definitely not perfect at this, but uh, it's part of its creativity um, and looking at scenarios based on what choices do I have um, and then using language internally that doesn't give my power away to someone else or something else that allows me to continue to be a being that can make choices and isn't essentially we call it victim mentality. I'm not succumbing to this idea that because all these other things are going on, um, I can't succeed or I, I, I have an excuse. Um, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Victor Frankl. He, he wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning or Man's Search for Happiness, something like that. He, uh, he was the Jewish neuroscientist who was put in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And he wrote a book about how, partially about how he survived the, this, you know, these, these torturous conditions. And it was because he still had a choice. No matter what they did to him, they never took away his ability to choose. And he chose very powerfully in, in that moment that he wouldn't allow them to impact him and affect him. And he said, in between the stimulus and the response, there's a space. And that space is what separates us from the animals. That allows us to not act on reflex or reaction or instinct. That allows us to choose. Um, and so if you, if you find yourself having like this kind of victim speech, I had to, so they made me, uh, I, I couldn't like, hey, sorry, I couldn't make the meeting. I had to go pick my mom up from the airport. Yeah, your mom's important to you and you didn't have to go pick her up from the airport. You chose to go pick her up and not make the meeting. And that's okay. That's not making you wrong, but you're, you're now speaking from the perspective of someone that's choosing your actions rather than being the victim of a circumstance uh, where most people would say, oh yeah, no problem. I understand. You got to go pick up your mom from the airport. No big deal. The conversation is, you chose to go do that rather than this. And I'm not making you wrong about it, but you might've been able to call her an Uber 
or tell her you were going to be late. <laughs> or, you know, there's also potential creative solutions around this perceived uh, situation where you didn't have control that you might have been able to control. And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that kind of a co coherent nice. rambling, but just the idea of being a, an individual that's powerful and can make choices and you don't give that power to a circumstance or a person or a situation by saying I had to, they made me uh, looking at it from the perspective of what choice can I still make here and how can I be creative about a solution to this so I can still do what I said I was going to do or I could prepare to when this comes up again, do what I said I was going to do next time and, and not put myself in a situation where I might have conflicting commitments. So thank you. No, that was, that was really good, dude. Appreciate that. Yeah. I, I, what I wrote down there was that you have a, a victor mentality. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, instead of a victim mentality, um, yeah. kind of, kind of in line with Victor Frankel, but a victor as a victory. Oh, mindset. I didn't, I didn't put that there too. Yeah. Victor versus the victor. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, a victor mindset. Um, yeah, it, you know, there's there's just a lot of this talk around the foo foo, like, you know, walk on coals, you know, a positive mental attitude. But like, I I don't I don't I, what I don't understand, Charlie is like, how do people go through life pissed off and angry and have like a limited mindset? Like, how how like how in the world do you just like? the world's out to get you all the time. How do you see that? How do you, I mean, I get how you do it, but like, I don't understand how that is like, I cannot wait to walk outside and think the world is out to get me today. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Un unfortunately there's, there's a lot of baggage people, people bring with them. Um, you know, especially from childhood. Uh, I, I completed a, uh, seminar, a forum called the landmark forum actually in Houston. And a big, the whole methodology or the whole practice is completely recreating uh, from nothing. And in order to do that, you have to go back and confront and uh, get completion on things in your life that have caused you to, to end up having that lens over your perspective. And so... I, I don't think maybe anybody necessarily chooses to have that kind of a perspective without having some kind of influence. And it can take, it can take, you know, therapy, it can take coaching, it can take, I, I, I it usually does take all of these things to have somebody else help somebody out of that kind of a mentality, because it's, it's really a blind spot for most people. I think, you know, not knowing what you don't know, People, myself included, you know, have, have had, you know, these experiences where I have a, an occurrence or a view of something and then I uh, make a decision and a choice and then someone else comes in and says, hey, you know, what about all this? Like, Man, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even have, you know, that was my blind spot. That's some things that I didn't know that I didn't know. And so uh, I, I'm a huge proponent of, of coaching, of training, of seminars, of, of, of therapy, of, of people that are seeing you from a viewpoint that, uh, you know, obviously you don't have, uh, people can see your blind spots that, that you'll never see. People can see some of those things that you don't know that you don't know. And it can really help reprogram uh, with practice and, and a lot of effort that kind of a mentality, but you got to seek it out. Like if you don't seek it out and, and truly find ways to kind of shed yourself of some of that burden, that weight, it's, it's not just going to go away without some help. In my experience. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. Yeah. I think, I think uh, that's kind of where I guess you can say my, my personal journey, you know, started was actually getting into go getting into door to door. You know, I started reading in golden, Do reading in door to door. Like that's, that's the first time I ever read a book cover to cover besides like green eggs and ham in elementary school. Um, you know, getting that coaching and being around people that had that. I, and I, I had an interview a couple of weeks ago 
where I realized that that was one of the most important parts was that I was around people that believed in me. And it's not that I, it's cause I didn't, I didn't at first believe in myself and I'm sure you're in the same position where like, I didn't have confidence. I mean, I did, but I didn't, it was just confidence that I could, you know, knock somebody out was really all I was you know, hanging my hat on or confidence that I could go get <laughs> girls or whatever. It's like, like, Ooh, how far is that going to get you in life? Right. Yeah. Um, but having my confidence in myself, um, my ability to sell, my ability to, to deliver an outstanding experience to somebody within the solar industry, you know, that was, that was given to me by someone that had belief in me first. So yeah, I agree. And I'm a big proponent of going to conferences, events and therapy and all that stuff. And yep. Self self mastery, brother. It's really good. Let's, let's, uh, let's transition really quick. I wanted to know a little bit about this, a little about this, this hundred percent success rate. I know it's not exactly 100%, but I'm going to call it hundred percent. That is damn near hundred percent, bro. Um, tell me a little about how, how, what, I guess, what method were you using to get a hundred percent success rate in your, okay. For everyone's listening, 99.9999999% success rate. Um, of sale to install. Yeah, and uh, to be fair, my, my more historic numbers are closer to 90 something percent. I just had a great, a great year, yeah, that particular year, but. Um, still, so I mean, still, with, I, was, well, I was at 36% pull through rate in my early career and I didn't get up, I didn't get up to the eighties until way later on. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I might be a little bit different in this in that I, when I first learned how to do solar, I was trained on a two touch close. And, and technically it was a three touch if you include the appointment set. Um, we would set the appointment, come back another day, or if we can come back that night or whatever, um, then we would, in the initial presentation, go through you know, the relationship, uh, the ins and outs of, of what solar would do for them, what it wouldn't do for them, all the education, and, and then get to the point of qualification, get them qualified that we know they're gonna be able to proceed. Um, then say, hey, we're gonna take 24 hours, we gotta uh, finalize this design, make sure it's gonna fit on the home, I'm gonna come back within 24 to 48 hours, review what we came up with. And at that point, you, you'll, be, uh, you'll, you'll be given the opportunity to proceed uh, once we've made sure that it's gonna be a good fit and it's, it uh, works for the house. So there was still a little bit of held, held back. You know, they obviously, when you leave, they do their conversations, they have their talk, they do their research, do whatever. If I show back up at that house, they're signing you know, 100%. Now there's a lot of people that uh, I don't show back up because they're like, eh, I'm not, they're not interested. We talked, we're not interested. Um, I, I believe they will probably go to cancel within their three days or their seven days anyway. So everybody I show back up to that second time, it's a relatively quick visit. It's not a lot of time. It's 20 to 30 minutes. All right, good news. Uh, you are able to proceed the way that we presented it. Any final questions or concerns you came up with? No, great. Here's, you know, I'll do a big review of it. They sign, we do the welcome call, we shake hands and they're super happy. Um, never once was anyone ever pressured into anything given any you know, reason to want to back out because of buyer's remorse. They were given that 24 to 48 hour time period to do their research, check it out, check me out, check the company out. And uh, again, there's people that decided, called me up, hey, we don't want the second appointment. We're just not interested. We talked about it. And I didn't really get a chance to overcome the objection because it was done over the phone or text or they just didn't show up or whatever. But anyone that d did accept that follow-up appointment within that 48 hour time window, they, they signed because they made the decision, low pressure. Uh, and, and I also want to do a quick shout out for TriSmart is if I didn't have a company that was able to install uh, quickly, effectively, professionally with a great back office and great communication, you know, we're not perfect. We screw stuff up all the time. Um, if I didn't have a company that I trusted to be able to get these people through the process in the way that they did, um, I wouldn't have been able to have that install rate as well. So huge shout out to our operations team, our customer uh, project management, all the people that help uh, do that. Um, but yeah, nobody ever bought because they ever felt pressured. Um, one big thing I'm, I'm huge on is also the ethics and the integrity of understanding your market. Um, if you're listening to this and, and you're in the state of Texas or really any other state, you've got to understand how your, your utility company treats solar. And uh, if you're giving people the wrong expectation, uh, that's, that's not going to work. That's not a lot of good long-term, uh, not a good long-term success, uh, strategy. So, 
Uh, also, just giving people the right expectations. So um, it was a it was a two touch. I think only one, maybe two of those hundred. You know, the husband looks at the wife. Wife looks at the husband. Said, "We doing this?" Uh, and they're like, "Yep, let's do it." And I'm like, "All right, let's go ahead and sign up." Like at that point, you know, they they are already ready to go. But uh, most of it, they were given that opportunity to do their own due diligence. And one of the things I've been working on learning over the, the last couple of years is figuring out that one touch close because it's a, it's a little bit of a different conversation, the different way to set it up and then a different, different way to close it and, and have that final conversation. But um, I, that's one of the biggest things I think I can point to the pull through rate is, is they were nearly all signed on second or third visit, if, depending on how you want to look at it. And one thing I'll say is I feel like that, that process has helped me generate a lot of referrals. Uh, from people who confidently and comfortably made that decision, uh, had no buyer's remorse. Uh, I feel like I'm that kind of person they want to refer to their friends and family because uh, it's not a high pressure situation. It's a, a very a bunch of very targeted key questions, helping them come to the conclusion on their own, mixed with education, a lot of relationship and connecting. Um, and people just feel comfortable and, and enjoy purchasing solar from me because that's just the kind of guy I am. Someone doesn't want to do it. I'm not going to strong arm into, uh, into and definitely not going to lower, lower the ethics or the integrity of the proposal to get them to proceed on, on false pretenses. Wow. Yeah, that is uh that is a very important key there. Um, what do you know what your percentage of, of referral rates are now? Roughly. Or um, most of my business lately has been from referrals. I have about three or 400 installs just in this one state, and most of them here in San Antonio. Uh, after 2020, my role changed into the company to where I am more you know, behind this desk thing and not necessarily in the field as much as I, my heart truly wants to be. But uh, That's why you say you like knocking on doors, because you can't knock as much. That's that's every single time I've ever talked. I'm like, bro, I love knocking on doors. And it's really what you're saying is I hate being behind the dang desk. (laughs) You you, you, you read me like a book. No, if I'm being really honest with you, even when I was knocking on doors, I love it. Like, and that's another, I don't know how much time we have. That's another mental thing. Um, I was, uh, Mark, uh, the the owner of TriSmart, one of the very first trainings ever gotten alarms was make the decision once. Don't wake up every day deciding if you want to go knock doors or if you're going to like it or not. Make it once and then go do it. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I've never had doubts, like, you know, doubted my entire life tr- set of choices sometimes when you're just in the middle of a slump. But I, I've truly, being someone that wants to focus on choices, I've chosen to love knocking doors and I made that choice a long time ago. And yes, I don't get to knock enough doors as much as I would like to right now. And maybe that's just an excuse and I need to go make it happen either way. But um, when I get the opportunity to go knock, I absolutely love it. And that's, that's been the case for years for me um, because I don't want to ever have to deal with, do I want to wake up and go do my job? Like, no, I get to go do my job and I absolutely love it. I'm going to meet new people and have a great day because I love what I do. So Really, and and yes, really I don't get to knock enough doors uh, and I need to, when I get to go shadow offices or go out and visit, um, one of the first things I like to do is say, hey, who can I go knock doors with? Let's, let's get out, let's go knock some doors. So. Yes. Yes, dude. And I love that you said that. Um, one of the, another, again, key attribute I'm seeing in every single Golden Door Award winner that I've ever interviewed or coached um, is that you are conclusive, you're decisive, you make decisions, you're definitive in your, in your, in your choices. Um, you decided to knock doors once. I think that was an outstanding quote that you said, um, that, uh, that your, that your, your, uh, your cousin, Mark, your boy, Mark, um, you know, let you know, I, I think that's, again, one of the main attributes, uh, that, a, a high performer, a golden door award winner um, is, you know, it's the same thing in, in your relationship, you know, in, in your relationship with your wife, in your relationship with your kids, like you have decided to be that dad, you've decided you've got the, you've got the, the amount of hours you're going to be able to spend at your daughter's soccer, soccer games, your son's, you know, soccer, baseball, football, basketball games, you know, maybe hockey. I don't know. Uh, 
you know, you've decided to do that. So I think that that's a, that's a, just a, a differentiator in, in high performers that we are, we make the decision and we go with it. Cause there's no turning back. Again, you get, you're not giving yourself excuse. You got to win at all costs, you know, see this thing to completion. What? Oh, oh, COVID, uh, or oh, storm or, you know, hurricane or, or, you know, issue with this or issue with that, or, oh, the government took all my money. Oh, okay, cool. I'm starting right where I'm at. Like, let's go. Yeah. You said you were wanting to talk about something there. I don't know if you, if you wanted to jam on that and we've got as much time as you need, bro. We're good. Cool. No, that, uh, so a lot of people call that they're non-negotiables. Um, or, or at least that's, that's related to this kind of conversation is, uh, for me, I provide for my family. That's a non-negotiable. And if that means I got to knock doors, then going and knocking doors, it's, it's not a question of, am I going to do this or not? It's how am I going to do it better? And how am I going to improve my numbers, improve my ratios? Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people talk about their why. You know, there's that book by Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And it's, it's an incredible uh, way to take the mindset out of the money because money is a very base form of motivation. Most people, if you talk through the different levels of why <laughs> they want to be successful, what's that money going to do for you? Why does that mean something to you? They're going to get to something a little bit more emotional, a little bit more connecting. And, and for me, when I've done that exercise with, with my coaches, it comes down to choices. I want my family to have choices. Not that my upbringing was wrong or bad. I had a lot of great choices, I had incredible upbringing, but I work so that my kids have choices and have opportunities. Um, and, and the money and the financial success and all of that, that plays into that. So the dollar amount in the bank account, I, what, what 20 is, most of 2020, I never even looked at my bank account. Like most of my bills are on auto pay. I didn't even like the, the money wasn't the motivator at that point. The, the motivator was hitting those numbers. And I knew the byproduct was going to be the money and, and the income, but right. um, yeah, just, just kind of dialing in the essence of your why getting money away from the motivation. What kind of contribution are you going to make to yourself, to society, to, to somebody else? And, and the contribution you're going to make uh, in the world, for, for most people, they just want to contribute. They want to be part of a team. Uh, and the money, you know, is, you know, you find something you do for free at some point to just contribute. The money is just a byproduct. That's awesome. Wow. So... A lot of people ask me this question a lot too, is Mikey, what books are you reading? So Charlie, what books are you reading? Good question. Um, currently I just finished never split the difference is what it's called by Chris Voss. I'm surprised I hadn't read that one earlier in my career because it was awesome. Um, just the, the mentality of never splitting the difference. Uh, that, that book was right up my alley. I absolutely loved it. Um, prior to that, it's been a lot of Simon Sinek, Leaders Eat Last, Start With Why, a lot of Jocko Willink, uh, Extreme Ownership, Dichotomy of, Le Dichotomy of Leadership. Um, one of the best ones is David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me. And then you get uh, Sales EQ by Jeb Blunt. That one's actually one that not a lot of people have heard recommended. That was one of my favorites. Um, shoot, there's a bunch of them. Just just that kind of stuff. A lot of the John C. Maxwell, the, the different, you know, seven levels of leadership, I think is what it's called. There's, there's a, he's written a bunch of them. I have a few of them queued up in my audible. Uh, the alchemist was one I finished recently that a lot of people had recommended that, that had a lot of really great you know nuggets in it. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm a, a firm believer in, in just lifelong education. I didn't finish my degree. I, I, I plan on it just to set a good example for my kids that I finished stuff that I started, but you know, it might be, the, a little more of a windy journey to get there. Uh, I'm close, but um, I read a book a long time ago called My Personal MBA. And it was a guy that talks about how you can go through traditional uh, schooling and education and get an MBA degree. And, and, and there's an opportunity cost there. There's a physical cost there. Or you, know, you can read all these books and, and do all these things and search out these different to uh, topics and, and subjects and really dive in as an entrepreneur and, and get that a similar education you know, as, as if an MBA 
graduate would have. And if I'm not going to go work at Goldman Sachs or, you know, <laughs> some, some, you know, big investment firm or, or be in the financial world, I can get that education, that experience through reading and learning and, and continuing to grow. And there is no shortage of, of books out there. Uh, you know, Tim Ferriss and all his books on productivity, uh, you know, the, the military angle, the, the guys that are prior military that I really connect with because their experiences are very similar and a lot of less similar lessons. Just, just never stop learning, never stop growing and getting complacent because if you're not learning and growing and, you're in, and the complacency kicks in, you're never coasting. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. There's no, there's no coasting. I love that. Um, said your favorite book was Sales EQ. I have not read that. So I'll, uh, I'll definitely pick that up and I'll let you know as soon as I'm done with it, I'll send you my notes on it. So I appreciate that. Awesome. Uh, I've definitely read a lot of John C. Maxwell books. That's a, a big leadership thing, which I want to try to get into now. Um, if we can, um, one thing you said there is that if you know, you, you're, and I want to talk about this before we get into leadership, but you said, you know, cause the quote on your wall here, and I see it on your Instagram a bunch too, it's complacency kills. Um, you know, if you're not growing, you're, you know, if you're not going forward, you're going backwards in, in your mental state. So how, how is that actually, I mean, give me some tangible things here. How has that directly affected your relationship with your wife, relationship with your kids and then your business? Yeah. The, the idea like complacency is synonymous with being comfortable. Um, the, the job that, that we do as door knockers is one that you, you get to always stretch yourself and get out of your comfort zone. And if you find yourself coasting and getting comfortable, like you got to find a way to snap back in and say, all right, what else can I do to be uncomfortable today? Like how, how could I do this uh, to be more uncomfortable than I was before? And, and cause that's where the growth comes. Um, this is going to sound stupid. A little, little story. Uh, we ran an incentive for a team actually in El Paso that if they hit a certain amount of accounts, I'd come out and knock doors an entire day in the summer of El Paso in a suit and tie that, that they got to pick out from the Goodwill. Uh, so they actually didn't hit the incentive. And I was like, I'm going to do it anyways. I've never knocked doors in a suit and tie buttoned up, you know, with a hat from a Goodwill. Uh, and there's a little picture and a silly video of me. I went and knocked, you know, four or five hours, sweat my brains out in a suit and tie, uh, knocking doors in El Paso from a suit I had just barely picked up from Goodwill. Um, I feel like it looked pretty sharp, but it was a Goodwill suit. So it was just something for me because I hadn't done anything in a while to get uncomfortable and to do something that I'd never done before. And I was like, let's try it out. I set a couple of appointments. It wasn't any massive monstrous day, uh, but it was fun. It was fun to do something that I had never done before. And, you know, this complacency kills sign has a little bit deeper of a meaning, you know, for me in that uh, when we deployed overseas, to, especially where I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, all of the, the little tiny bases that we would come and go from, they had this sign plastered all over every entrance and exit as a reminder that the second you get comfortable, the second you aren't, uh, you know, being a hard target, like looking like you're, you're being lackadaisical, that could actually very literally mean death. And not necessarily for you. It could be for the guy to your left and your right, which would be an absolute travesty if you chose to get complacent and do something that caused the death of somebody else. You know, you want to be an idiot and go off and do something stupid and get yourself killed. That's on you. The worst thing that could happen is you don't do your job and you, you get complacent. You miss some, something, you leave something, and it impacts, you know, your brother to your left or your right. That's the true travesty and tragedy um and so that idea of just always um seeking to improve and, and looking out for the people to your left and your right um, and recognizing that the choices that you're making don't always just impact you um, for example we had in 2020 i think we had 12 15 install crews we weren't as big as we are now but um you know they had families to feed every, every single crew has three four installers and if we didn't go out and put put deals in you know, we had 200 W2 employees at the time that if we didn't get out there and, and, and do the uncomfortable things to bring the sales in, you know, they wouldn't have jobs. So how can I continue to approach like my actions from the, the perspective of uh, what I'm choosing to do or not to do doesn't just impact me. It impacts the people 
to my left and my right, maybe even people I'll never even meet or, or, or ever know. Um, so yeah, a, a friend of mine made that little sign for me and we actually uh, blew one up and put it in all our offices just as a reminder that as soon as you get comfortable, that's, that's, that, that kills it. That kills your, uh, your visions, your aspirations, your success, uh, and all the things you could accomplish if you're always seeking um, to find that next level of being uncomfortable. Um, there's, there is so much meat and potatoes around what you just said there, Charlie. Thanks for that. I needed to hear that too. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was big time, bro. It, it goes for me um, too. It goes, it goes for everybody. There's a, there's nobody that's a master. At this There's nobody that's perfect at this. And, and I, I, it's a constant reminder for myself. Uh, you have people that count on you. You have people like this is bigger than you. Uh, you have people to your left and your right. You've got a, a company full of employees that have, you know, wives and kids that you'll never meet. And if you don't continue yeah. to push and grind and help get sales and help build the sales organizations, uh, you know, their, their dad or their mom's gonna be out of a job, and and that's not okay with me. So it, it just it's a good continual motivator to just to continue to push and find ways to. You know, do all the things we talked about, succeed, find ways to win. Um, and there's people that count on you more than, more than, you know, and that's a big motivator, That that's huge for me. Yeah. There's a, there's a really big, so what comes to my brain there is it, we run a, every, every one of my companies that I've ever ran or been a part of, or consulted or coached uh, is a for purpose business, meaning that they, that we give a, a portion of our proceeds, uh, money, time, talent, resources, or network, um, to some sort of a, a charitable cause, right? Um, uh, some sort of a, 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 a to make a, you know, a, the world a better place. Mm -hmm. right? And what, what comes to my mind there is that I was talking with my dad last night, I was on the treadmill and I'm like, walking out like a, you know, 12% incline nice. and sweating my butt off. And my dad's like, you know what, my dad's in a, in the third phase of his life where he's giving back and things like this. And he's, you know, he's looking, he's, we're talking business and he's talking about how the, um, the charity that he's looking at right now, like they're, they're, they're having, they had to shut down one of their charity dinners or some along those lines in hit the city that is in North Carolina because of the, because of the lack of uh, donations. And I'm like, what you said there was the people that you don't even know, right? If you guys don't go out and on the sales side, go out and sell, right? That means that the installers, assuming that they are charitable in some way, that the people that, that you and I do not know, but wh what they do in their personal life and they're charitable, whether it's their church or a charity or a nonprofit or NGO, what, however they're giving back, um, they're not going, the, the person that down, down the line, six or seven people or six or seven families is not going to be able to get that, um, you know, not just a handout in a bad way, but that social, that socialized, you know, care that I, I believe, I don't believe on socialism in a, in a, ma in a macro, I believe socialism in a, in a micro, like where the family should take care of, help take care of you. Like in the church, you should take care of the people, like the orphans, the widows, and the orphans, you know, and, and, and the, the, the people that are down and out that we should do that. Um, how complacency in the ch in the charitable giving side of it, like, yeah, I'm just I'm like baffled. <laughs> uh, don't even I'm like lost for words at, at how uh, if I don't step up my game again. And I, and and here's the downside. Here's the weird part of this whole thing, Charlie, is that I run circles around people, and yet I'm still I can do more. Like I can do more and, and what, what's, what scares other people looking from the outside. And I know that again, as, as a high performer, as you are, and the ones that are listening to this, that are high performers, um, you know, people look at Mikey Lucas and they're like, dude, you need to slow down. You're going to burn out. You're, you're grinding. And you know what happens when you grind things down. And I'm like, you know, you're burning on both that candles on both ends. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea what I'm capable of. This is not even probably 70%. And I'm out running you. Well, that's because unfortunately you're running at 20, 30%. Um, I, I know I need to do more and I just kicked me in the butt there. So I appreciate it. I needed to hear that. Yeah, man. That's awesome. That's good stuff. Thanks. Yeah. 
let's end here. I want to, I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about leadership. Um, back, back to this civilian and military. One of the downsides about the problems in solar, um, or in door to door and in business, you know, we, and, and when I say door to door, like dude, any, every business is the same. We're dealing with people, right? You know, imperfect, you know, non -per not perfect people, you know, leadership, how do you get somebody to do something? How do you incentivize people to do something that, you know, really at the end of the day is beneficial for them and the company. So I want to talk to you about some leadership um, because I, I can, I can see that you're an outstanding leader and that you're somebody that's worth following because of how you live your life. And I know that you're not perfect and I don't even need you to talk about that anymore. Cause dude, like we're not, none of us are perfect, right? None of us are, none of our marriages are perfect. None of our sales are perfect. And you know, we all make mistakes, but I can tell that how you treat yourself and how, the standard you hold yourself to um, shows me that you are credible, um, that you have a that credibility to be able to speak to this, this topic here. So let's talk about some leadership stuff. So, so tell me some mistakes that you've made in leadership that um, other golden door award winners that are, that are leaders or that run offices now, um, you know, how, how can, how can, how can you help uh, in, in, you know, teaching us about some mistakes you've made? Man, where do I start? How much time do we have? Uh, mistakes I've made. <laughs> um, I, I would, I would say if I could sum it all up uh, in, in a couple sentences, it's, finding ways to not manage emotions, so to speak, even personalities, but more performance agreements, but at the same time, get connected, get, get truly connected with your people. Some of the most impactful people in my life have been people that remembered my birthday, people that remembered what energy drink I liked, and, and then they brought it, you know, like the, the simple things. They remembered that I had said something a while ago that was the meaningful to me and whether they went and wrote it down or, and they were intentional about, you know, creating this connection or they just were that kind of person that remembered some of those details. Um, the most influential, impactful people and leaders on me were the ones that weren't even trying to get me to do something. They were looking at connecting with me uh, on, a, on a human to human level, like very genuinely. And at the same time, we had performance conversations, right? We were able to also like unlock that part of the relationship where the performance conversations came from a matter of what I agreed to, what I committed to versus what I actually did, where the gap was, and how do we help you inside that gap? Um, it wasn't, uh, you're wrong, you're bad because you didn't do this, get off my team. Because there was that connection there uh then that that production performance conversation was able to come to, from a place where i i knew that they cared i knew that that there was uh empathy and not hey i want you to produce because you're going to make me money and if you're not making me money you're out and that's something i've continued to struggle with and i continue to look at, at ways i can connect on, on a, a very human level you know the, the book how to win friends and influence people is is so good and that you're not trying to manipulate uh you're, you're really just trying to connect you're finding ways to help people genuinely feel like you they mean something to you in your life and, and that, that they their life <laughs> uh means something um and they're contributing um and also when you get into those performance conversations you have uh uh, the, the how to win friends and influence people talks about this emotional bank account. You, you've made investments and deposits into this relationship, this emotional bank account, so that when it comes time to potentially have, you know, a, a, a conversation that with, with a different person could be argumentative or come off condescending or, or whatever, you've got all these deposits in this relationship. And, and so that this conversation can now be one uh, of of imp production improvement empathy and, and so yeah that that's something that if i could sum up what i wish i'd started looking at a long time ago and, and continuing to work on it's find ways to have that balance still have performance agreements still manage the agreement not necessarily the emotion or the personality but in order to manage a lot of those agreements there does need to be a human personal genuine connection that I, I'm where I am because I want other people to be successful. 
I can't be successful without their success, but their success isn't the only uh, reason. How do I say this? Like me being connected with that person isn't just so I can be more successful. It's for their success. And the more I can approach my conversations with people and try to have that balance of deposits into this emotional bank account and needing to have these, you know, what might be perceived as tough conversations when it comes to production and performance. If there's a lack in that emotional bank account, it's going to be a, a very different conversation. So yeah, that, if I could summarize it it, it, it would be looking at your leadership and your influence and your impact from the standpoint of finding a way to be able to do both. Uh, Cause if it ends up being one or the other, you're going to have a bunch of friends that are all low performers. And for their life, for their good, you're doing them no service, allowing that friendship to overshadow the performance agreements because they're not changing their lives. They're not, you know, creating generational wealth to, that, that could be created in this industry. They're continuing as low performers and your friendship is actually hurting them. And so on the flip side, if you're just, hey, you got to hit these numbers or get off my team, you're going to lose people that that could be very valuable to your organization if there's not that connection that you're creating so that you can have those performance and production conversations. So. Wow. Seeing people for the best version of themselves, seeing people for what they can be, you're doing them no service by allowing them to slack. Yeah. Um, showing tough love, like hardest, hardest part about leadership, I think is showing that tough love. And I, I know that great leaders, um, great leaders have consistently reminded me and shown me personally that they care more about my well being and my family and seeing the potential that Mikey had. Um, and I see that you do that with your people as well. And I do my hats off to you. That is an outstanding, outstanding, uh, attribute of a leader. And I knew that you were a leader worth following. Um, I just, yeah, again, dude, that makes me, makes me warm and fuzzy inside because knowing you're a great, you're a great father as well and a great husband. Well, one of the things the military did influence in this regard is, uh, you know, and, it all, and it's referenced in the book, Leaders Eat Last, another Simon Sinek book, is there's a tradition in the military that the lowest or the newest ranking person, and it's any, any time to go eat, they eat first, they're the front of the line, and then you kind of go backwards and and rank and seniority. And I remember uh, there were times uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan when we would go out on missions and one of our leaders, our officers knew that we were gonna be back and it was chow time, it was time to go get dinner. They would wait, they would sit in the back of the chow hall and wait until they knew that we got back safely and had a chance to eat the warm food. You know, they would, they would, they would sacrifice their comfort, right, for, their their group and their team and that was just always very impactful and so this idea that leaders eat last um it doesn't it doesn't mean the leaders being um what's the word i'm looking for uh like condescending or, or high and mighty it's it's Respectful. yeah or, or or even hey look at me i'm i'm gonna show you how empathetic i am or how interested i am. I mean it's, it's it's that culture it's that that fabric of what that organization is, and it's built on the idea that your leader would do anything for you. The alpha of your pack is the alpha for a reason, and they would sacrifice everything for you. Um, and, and then just being the kind of leader that that does that, leads by example. And you know that that book's one of my favorites when it comes to just conversations about leadership. And that military example, I mean, it's all, it's just, it's seared in my brain. I'm never going to forget seeing those officers that just waited uh, until people came back and, and they got a chance to eat and then they went and ate and did their thing. So yeah, that, that, that idea is, is been, been something that's been very powerful for me. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, one of those aha moments. I think you could say you definitely have is seeing that. So that's a Really, really awesome example that you're now. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming through the years you've seen how your leadership uh, inside of your business now um, has paid off or has shown dividends um, by you showing that same uh, inspired uh, leadership style 
um, within your office when, you know, sometimes it's the guy that we don't think is going to make it. We end up showing the, the amount of love and encouragement to, and, and, and tough love to that ends up making it. And then that next year pulls his head out of his butt and starts working, uh, the, like he should and makes it. And then boom, turns into somebody that is an outstanding individual for, you know, humanity and for his family. Let's end here, bro. What is, tell me about this whole, I love knocking on doors. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that other than probably myself. Um, even though I say, I'm like, Hey, look, you know, I don't love knocking on doors. Um, but I love what the results I get from it. What, what do you mean by I love knocking on doors? Explain that to me really quick. Yeah. Fair question. Um, I, I mean that I made a conscious decision to love knocking on doors uh, and any, anyone can make that decision. It's a decision. I, it, it, it's, I made it. I love knocking doors and, and that's, it's, it's, it's freeing in a sense that when I get the opportunity to go knock doors, I love it. I just, I, it's taken time to also be confident in it. And I think a lot of people mistake confidence versus loving it. Like you can love it and, and suck at it. You can love it and not be confident in it, but, but loving it's still a choice. And this, in this instance, like, it's not like, I, I'm going to choose, you know, uh, like a passionate love for somebody. The word love in this context is I enjoy it and I can choose what I enjoy and I can choose what I don't enjoy. And I'm, I've chosen to enjoy knocking doors and, and in, in the cold, in the dark, in the rain, in, in the heat, whatever it is, I, I, I enjoy it. And if I see an opportunity to stretch myself in, in, in a downpour or in 110 degree heat, I think, what can I do to prepare for the variables that I'm going to be uh, faced with and, and accomplish something I haven't accomplished before? And then just go stare it in the face and love it because that's your choice. You, you can choose to do that or you can choose not to. And if you choose not to and you choose not to long enough, like you're probably not even listening to this podcast. You're not even going to be in this industry. You're going to be doing something else. Um, but it goes back to what we said earlier is make that choice once. And, and, and it can be something that you don't fake. Like it's not a fake it till you make it. It's just, just choose to love it. Like, it's your choice. Like, I don't, I don't like okra. Sorry to anyone that uh, loves okra. I can't stand it, but that's because I'm choosing to not enjoy it. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to eat. It. I'm not allergic to it. I just don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> door knocking is can can be like that for anybody you, i could i could choose to like it i could choose to eat it i could do all that stuff and but because i can control the action of of enjoying something or not um uh, i've chosen to enjoy it that's uh that's outstanding dude you you see a you see a a significant difference in people that love work completely dislike work and it is comes down to the choice of this is where I'm at. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to choose to have a positive mental attitude, can do mindset, whatever it takes attitude, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, like it goes back to the, I don't know why people show up and just hate what they do. Yeah. I say, I don't, I don't really have a job. I just have a really lucrative hobby. I just, I just love to do what I do. And at the end of the day, you know, my, my wife probably thinks I just hang out with my friends all day. And that's my job, <laughs> my job description, because it really is. I get to go spend time with my friends Preach. and, uh, and, and it pays the bills. And so I, I absolutely what I do. I was wearing joggers yesterday in the, in, in the house. And my wife's like, you get to wear, because I, like I was, you know, wearing joggers. Right. And I had a polo on and she's like, you get to wear joggers to work. And I'm like, I don't really look at it like that this isn't really work. I mean, it is, but, and I guess, yeah, I'm wearing joggers. <laughs> like I've worn these knocking doors too. So yep. I don't know, whatever. Like, <laughs> it's like, what'd you expect me to wear a suit every day? Yeah. Uh, man, I love it. Well, dude, I really appreciate this time. I know that, uh, I got a lot. I mean, I got two and a half pages worth of notes here, um, that I'm going to go back through and, and study myself. Um, I, I find myself going back through and re-listening to these shows and studying them because again, success leaves clues, you know, there is a proven formula for, for becoming a top performer, you know, you are as efficient, effective and productive as, as it's going to get. Um, and obviously, you, you know, everyone can get better, but dude, like 
you, you're you're doing it you're living it you you got three kids like I, I need to understand which is why i am privileged to say that i've got to sit and have a conversation with you and get into the the weeds um of of your life um because i i don't know how i'm gonna have children and still do what i do so i, I really really actually like generally appreciate you sharing and opening up with me yeah you bet you'll do, you'll do fine i appreciate the opportunity it's always uh ho hopefully it can make a difference for someone listening to this and also it's good to to have it come out of my mouth and just listen to it again and realize man uh there, there's there's a lot of improvements there's a lot of things that i could could be doing along the same lines of stuff i already said and and i've got a little mental checklist of things i'm gonna get back to and and, and always constantly seek to improve absolutely man well, Charlie, where, uh, where can people find you and uh, how can we support you, man? Yeah, check out TriSmart Solar, uh, TriSmartSolar.com. Um, the word try as in triangle and then smart. Um, we're all over uh, just about every major city in the state of Texas. Um, I'm on Instagram and, and Facebook uh, and Twitter. And so you can check us out there. And uh, we also have an office in Phoenix that we've been working on growing. So if you're in the Phoenix uh, Tempe area, uh, we've got, uh, some great and, and very loyal reps and, and a great cr set of crews out there. So, um, yeah, if you, if you see solar in the state of Texas, uh, check us out. Awesome, man. Appreciate it. And I'll put all your, um, your, your, uh, your links in the, in the show notes below. Um, other than that, Charlie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. God bless. Love, you know, I hope you have a, a great rest of the year and an outstanding start to your, uh, to your 2023 career. So, um, uh, Thank you, Charlie. Hey, Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mikey. Appreciate the, inv uh, the invitation.